Welcome to Screen Therapy. I'm your host, Jason Schurz. In October of 2018, I found myself in the hospital, sitting across from a psychiatrist who was telling me I had bipolar. I was sent home with a bunch of medication and laid on the couch for a week. I had my iTunes library on shuffle, trying to shake the hornet's nest from my head. Ever since I was a kid, I've been using loud music as a form of therapy. Punk rock and mental health have always been connected. This podcast looks at that connection through the lens of different guests. This is Screen Therapy. Almost to the point where in the past I've given up, but this time something keeps on telling me I've got to go on. So now I will try to get the lead out of my blood and lose the paralyzing mind to tower from above. I must stretch my constitution. Jessica Messino Drass's academic paper about the parallels between punk rock and art therapy starts with the lyrics to pass the point the song you just heard by East Bay pop-punk band, Tilt. The lyrics? Almost to the point where in the past I've given up, but this time something keeps on telling me I've got to go on. As a researcher and therapist, Jessica has used the inspiration punks get from music and each other to inform her art therapy practice. She's helped women with trauma build connection and resiliency and instill hope in themselves. In her academic paper, Jessica explains how punk's authenticity, nonconformity, and individualism can be applied to art therapy. She credits the tenets of punk rock for the empowerment she sees in the people she works with. We'll get into what those tenets are, but in the meantime, and it probably goes without saying, art doesn't have to be about pretty watercolor paintings. According to Jessica, art can also be about tearing things down and building them back up. My name is Jessica Messino Drass, and I got into punk first as a musician, but then really more as an organizer of shows and events and promotions and writing a zine, and then took my love of punk and the arts into my education and became a high school art teacher. But what I really always wanted to do was be an art therapist. And so after teaching high school art for a number of years, I went back to school and got my degree in art therapy. And now what I do is I'm a professor at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, and I teach future art teachers and future art therapists with my punk rock art therapy theoretical blend. Excellent. And we'll get into the article that you published, which is really interesting around punk rock's parallel to art therapy. But I wanted to ask you a little bit about how punk rock kind of realized that it was going to be such an important part of your life. A lot of it was the arts and music were always part of my life, my household and family. And actually, a lot of my training was on stage as a dancer. So I'm like a classically trained ballet dancer. And so that performance piece was a huge part of what I brought into the punk scene. As weird as it sounds, I discovered punk through MTV. So being a sixth grade girl entering middle school in September of 91, just as Nirvana's Nevermind was hitting mainstream, that just opened the floodgates. And so for me and my older brother, it just came at a time where there was a lot of difficulty in our lives and punk became a mechanism and a vehicle for that. And so Watching videos on MTV, even with punk, but also Headbangers Ball and getting into that metal side of things, using bands like Ministry and Bad Religion to like teach me history about the world and politics and government, it helped develop my perspective on what it means to be a teacher, what it means to be a member of society and really have brought that punk ethos all the way till current day. A lot of your work is around punk rock's parallels to art therapy. The article you published, Creating a Culture of Connection, a Postmodern Punk Rock Approach to Art Therapy, was very interesting. And I'm wondering when you first drew the parallels between those two things. So it's almost embarrassing to admit that it started with a BuzzFeed article, right? Like someone shared a BuzzFeed article where it was the nine most powerful lessons that punk rock teaches you. And I just looked at it and I looked at all of the things and I was like, oh, 
yeah, wow, this is true. And at that time, I was an art therapist working in a women's trauma treatment program. I printed out the article and brought it in as a prompt for an art therapy group. Started with a discussion and talking about those things. And it was really uh, amazing to see how the women in the group responded to these ideas. Because I think a lot of times for people that haven't experienced the punk community or didn't like grow up punk, they see the outward appearance of punk or they hear the music and they have a certain mindset of like, oh, that's what punk is and I'm not about that. But it was in delving more into that, that, you know, it was like, oh, people's eyes, but it was also opening my eyes. Wait a second. Like, it's kind of just that part of what framed my perspective and the way that I approached life as a teacher and a therapist that I didn't realize came from my experience in the punk community. You talk about the four core concepts of punk culture. Yeah. So in looking at this idea of like, okay, is it crazy to write a research article, like in a clinical journal on punk rock art therapy? But it was, I was recognizing that this work that we were doing, that this culture that I was trying to create in the art therapy room and in the groups that I ran, I was trying to recreate the punk culture that I grew up in, the community, that sense of community and that sense of, for us, growing up, I mean, I was in middle school and we were putting on outdoor concerts. I was, you know, always working the door and working with the local law enforcement and get like, just, I was so involved in so many things at like 13, 14, right? Like, so it was just always one of the concepts I call is empowerment through a DIY mindset. And so when we're working with trauma, the way to recover from trauma, how can you build a sense of hope and empowerment? in people or help them find that for themselves. And it was for me recognizing that that was a huge piece of my experience in the punk culture. So the four areas that I broke down to is one, the collapse of the hierarchy. So we talk a lot about how in punk, the musicians and the fans and the audience are intertwined. And so, you know, people jumping into the crowd or seeing people before shows, like it just being this community. It's not like arena rock that you can't touch the performers or have any conversations with. And so you're not having that hierarchical structure. And so it's a part of that. Then there's the search for authenticity and understanding. And so for me growing up, it was always, okay, so what is this about? And how can we bring our most authentic self to the table? Like my friends and I, like we did not look like carbon copies of each other. Our punk group of misfits or whatever, everyone had their own look. And so that search for authenticity and trying to understand more was a huge piece of it. And then this postmodern concept. So as a visual artist too, understanding the idea of deconstruction and breaking things apart and then putting them back together in a new way. So deconstruction and reconstruction. It's not just seek and destroy for the sake of destruction. It's not anger for the sake of being angry or violent. It's taking things apart. And then the most important piece though is putting them back together. So then that ties into that empowerment through the DIY mindset. We can have things that have happened to us, but they don't define who we are. And so from going into that trauma narrative, how do we rewrite that? Let's take it apart. Let's deconstruct it. But then we get to choose how we want to tell the story. We get to choose how we want to build whatever it is that's coming next for us. You talk about dialectical behavioral therapy quite a bit in your paper. And I took a DBT course for about 18 months, and I still don't have a complete handle on it. So let's do a snapshot on what DBT is, and then I want to ask you about punk and DBT. DBT, so going back to the program that I worked in, we were a full DBT program. And so we had all of the components. So DBT is Dialectical Behavior Therapy. It was created by Marsha Linehan. She was working a lot with CBT, which is Cognitive Behavior Therapy. But she was working with a lot of women, especially that were chronically suicidal. And she was recognizing that the CBT, so just working with changing thoughts and actions and behaviors, wasn't getting the full picture. There was something else. How are you building meaning? And so she created this whole new treatment approach that combined the principles of CBT with Zen Buddhism and mindfulness and acceptance. And that whole idea of mindfulness and acceptance of the moment as it is, I'm sorry, but there's almost nothing more punk rock than that. The urgency of the moment at hand and recognizing the moment and capturing it. 
that's the essence of the energy of punk. On its surface, DBT and punk rock seem like total oxymorons, right? Like how could they even be similar? But really it's a treatment method that focuses on accepting things as they are, but then building skills. So teaching skills in the areas of mindfulness, distress tolerance, emotional regulation, and interpersonal effectiveness. And then looking at what happens in your life and like actually stepping back and saying, okay, what happened and what led us up to that moment, right? Which to me goes into that search for authenticity and understanding component. But then also let's teach skills and let's bring what could you do when you're having a situation? And there's so much of this empowerment that gets put on the client themselves that it's like, it's up to the client to take ownership of their treatment, of their recovery, of what their life is going to be. And so DBT is built around this core concept of finding what's your life worth living goal. I talk a little bit in the paper too about this idea of punk as this utopian performative space, right? Where it's like anything was possible. DIY, we could be like, all right, we want to do this. We want to put on a huge show in the middle of this empty field and we're teenagers. How do we make it happen? And we figured out we made it happen. And so it's bringing that into it because in the program that I worked at, when women would come in, we were their last resort. They had already tried every other program. They'd been in and out of the hospital and chronically suicidal and had been through some really, really difficult things. There's that sense of feeling hopeless. I would bring in that punk ethos of hope and transformation, but not in a cheesy way, right? Like I never realized I was doing it that way. I found the overlap just natural. Yeah. And a lot of these words that we use for mental health struggles, even the word struggle, there you go. Yeah. Hope, journey, healing, transformation. I mean, they sound super cheeseball. Yeah. But that's what punk rock is about in, in a stripped down level. I mean, we can use some punker words, but that's essentially what it is. It actually just pops into my mind now of there is a DBT skill called alternate rebellion. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> they didn't teach me that in my program for some reason. I feel cheated. I'm upset with your program, right? But there's so much that is so punk rock about DBT. How can you go and be this version of yourself that can be against the grain, that can be not what everyone else wants you to be, and how that is so healing and so transformative you know and it is a skill called alternate rebellion like it doesn't mean saying like f you to the people around you it means being true in who you are even if that is going against the norm or not conforming and so yeah there's so much power in that so the folks that you work with in the art therapy that you do have you seen results with them as far as the punk informed therapy goes and what results have you seen? Is it clear to you how that's working versus maybe quote regular art therapy? Yeah. The weird thing is that I never once said to any client patient ever be like, I practice punk art therapy, right? <laughs> I never even would come in and be like referring to myself as punk or anything like that. And so it's more so using the word punk to explain a philosophy and approach to a method. And I wouldn't even suggest saying to a client, right? Like, oh, you know, what? I'm going to let you know that I, I do something called punk therapy, because there still is so much of that stigma of like, what is that? Like, actually, I use in one of my classes that I teach now at the university on writing the initial rejection comments that I got for the article from one of the peer reviewers, where it was just like, what is this punk stuff and what does it have to do with art therapy and there's no relevance and what does it even mean? But going back to the question about results, this notion of looking at these four concepts and how does focusing on that, how does creating a DIY atmosphere in the studio, I talk about how do I try to create a sense of scene and community through the performative space of therapy. And that I have seen so much results from, again, moving away from this hierarchical mindset that a lot of old school therapy is, right? Where it's like the therapist is the expert. I don't diagnose people, right? I always say you're the expert on you. 
or a lot of times people are going to want like, oh, well, my therapist said this. And like, they want to be like attached to their therapist forever. And I'm like, listen, I don't want you to need me forever. I want you to be able to do this on your own outside of here. So we're going to practice things and we're going to do things, but it's very much this DIY, like, no, make it work. Let's see what happens. Let's take it apart and put it back together. Like, let's not be afraid to be here. I'm going to use another DBT word. Let's not be afraid to be a little bit irreverent with ourself and with our story and with our notions of what the world should be and how we should act. So I take that little bit of an edge in. There's so much in the self-help field about, you know, good vibes only and focusing on the positive. And I'm like, but that's not the reality. Someone may come in looking like wearing bright colors and, and they start making, you know, like hearts and, and stars and rainbows when it's like, they can't stay out of the hospital with trying to hurt themselves. Okay. There's a discrepancy here. So what if we just, again, going back to that authenticity and that mindfulness of the moment, let's accept this moment sucks. This is like effed up. So how can we own that? How can we say, this is the truth of what this is. Our life is not about butterflies and sunshine and rainbows all the time. And so it's that punk edge, giving space to, I don't want to say cheesy, like darkness, but giving space to things that are difficult and confusing and maybe angry and violent, you know, actually gives us more permission to be fully who we are. It's that pushback against like, okay, wait, I feel this. I'm feeling this darkness. I'm feeling this pain from traumas that have happened or situations that have happened. And yet I'm supposed to be like, where's my gratitude journal? Again, nothing against gratitude (laughs) journals. Yeah. Sometimes I'd be like prescribing songs for people. Did you ever try this? Like, did you ever try listening to, I don't know, ministry or L7 or something like that, touching with the anger in that way? Yeah. And there's this false narrative that anger is a bad thing and it's not. It's funny because I'm thinking of DBT now and all the terms that I learned and how many of those could be punk rock band names. I'm actually in a band called Wise Mind, which is <laughs> more of there a noise go. project, but radical acceptance, distress tolerance, and all these names that could be used for that. I'm interested to hear a bit more about this art piece that you're talking about in your paper called The Evolution of Empowerment. I thought that one was very punk rock. Can you tell me about how that came together? I was a a fine art major, right? So I'm an art major and I went to college just outside of New York City. In the late 90s, I could literally see the skyline of New York City from our dorm window. So I say that because so much of my education was around going to museums and galleries and really at the cutting edge of art and looking at how boundaries were being pushed in this world of art and performance and how that's what we do in punk all the time, pushing these boundaries and understanding what those limits are. And I also studied, I eventually wound up at Rutgers in New Jersey, um, which has its own punk scene and, and everything like that. But I studied performance art and this idea of this performative space and creating a disruption in our social structure through actually transforming space. And so that is something that I brought into the classroom as a high school teacher, but then also into the therapy space. And so I would do things like lay out comic books all over the table or magazines and say, okay, everybody tear some pages out of these. This idea of being confronted with destruction or deconstruction, I'm working with, you know, adult women and they would come into the room and they'd be like, you want me to do what? I was like, imagine this is a gallery and there's all these magazines or books or comics out here and you're invited. It says like a sign, like, please come and take some or please tear a page out. And what that does when we're trying to defy a a social norm, right, of that we're supposed to just look at the art and don't touch it. It led to this great discussion, always would, of how do we define who we are? How do we sit with discomfort? How do we step outside of our comfort zone? How can we actively practice stepping out of the comfort zone? And if we think about a punk show, the punk community, that whole mindset is like the antithesis of a comfort zone. 
come on, like it's sweaty and you're all pushed together and you're maybe getting an elbow to the face or whatnot. We're practicing being uncomfortable. So how can we take that into a therapeutic space and using art as a way to do that is, you know, like I'm not going to go and take people that have been through trauma and be like, let's all go and like get in each other's face and elbow each other, right? No, that's unethical. We're not going to do that. So we can use the arts and, and visual art specifically in the practice of art therapy to practice this discomfort and this deconstruction and this creating a new narrative for yourself. We ended up finding like, well, wait, what were we tearing out? And it was all of these emotions that were part of it. And it was like, how can you go and encapsulate or preserve an experience in punk and in music, we've got a song that we can always come back to. And a song is a container, but how can we create a container for that experience to show like, oh, you actually did this. You practiced stepping outside of your comfort zone. And so we put them into this plastic jar and then they labeled it the evolution of empowerment. Not everybody was in the exact same spot with it. You know, some people were more comfortable with it than others. And I think in that instance, too, we also borrowed some quotes from Picasso. Every act of creation is first an act of destruction. So you have to destroy something that's in its current state anytime you make something new. So if you're writing down words on a piece of paper, you're destroying that blankness and you're creating something new with it. So how can we start to get a little more comfortable with examining and interrogating who we are and the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves in a way that is healing and helping us move towards that sense of hope and empowerment. A lot of punks, when they first get into it, this I'm speaking from my own experience and also from folks that I've talked to, intuitively they know that punk rock is therapy, that it's giving them therapy. But until I was diagnosed with bipolar three, four years ago, I didn't really realize how it was providing me with actual therapy, meaning the kind of therapy we talk about, art therapy, talk therapy, those kinds of things. Going back and realizing, oh my God, these bands actually were speaking to me in that way. Do you remember when you had that switch? For me, getting into punk and metal, and then I really got into like industrial and had to deal with a lot of death in a really short period of time when I was around 12, 13. And so it just became this natural outward expression of goth and harder edge and that darker side of things. And I'm from just outside Philadelphia. And so I was really fortunate that we had this really cool punk and goth and industrial scene in the mid nineties. So I knew then that this was a lifeline for me. And I knew that, you know, there were moments after that I got to perform this darkness. There was so much death around me and there was so much confusion with all of this grief and trauma and all of these really intense things happening. There was a moment where, yeah, I was pretty suicidal and I was actually wanting to go and find drugs and escape in that way. But there was just something like by having this scene and this community and this connection to this, well, I don't call myself straight edge. I maintained that kind of lifestyle throughout my high school years, which kept me here because I know that if I hadn't had that opportunity and looking back now, I really think it was a privilege to perform the darkness that I was feeling inside and experiencing outwardly through the way I dressed, through the shows I would go to, the music I would listen to, but then being able to transform it into creating a zine, putting on shows, really being an integral part of creating this punk community. I knew then that there was something there that was therapeutic. And then around that time, a friend's mom told me about art therapy. She was a psych nurse in a local hospital. And she said, you know, there's an art therapist there that reminds me of you. And I think that would be cool. And from that moment, I was hooked. And so I always knew there was a connection between making art in such a way like my art isn't drawing still lifes. It's in putting pieces together. And so I knew that there was like an abstract way that art could be a vehicle for these things. 
the connection was always there for me. And I knew that having that and teaching others about that was something that I always just had to do. And so that's kind of where I feel like I'm just continuously at now. I don't know. I just feel like it transcends punk and it transcends art and even art therapy, right? Like there's just this innate need to build community and this power in the expression of pain through fast music and beats and moving things around and through some form of aggression that is transformative and not just aggression and anger for the sake of destruction and violence. It's that transformative piece that I'm just continuously trying to recreate, educate, and explain. That was my conversation with artist, researcher, and therapist, Jessica Messino-Drass, JessDrass.com. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Scream Therapy. I'm coming to you from Powell River, a small coastal town in British Columbia, Canada, on the traditional territory of the Klohama Nation. Doing this podcast and talking to other folks living with mental health challenges has been a huge part of my journey. It means the world to me that you're out there listening. You can sign up for my newsletter and find more episodes at ScreamTherapyHQ.com. That's ScreamTherapyHQ.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Let's talk punk and mental health. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, take care and be well. Yeah,